Taylor Twelman covers soccer, former uh, United States uh, men's national player and uh, analyst for the Mothership, and uh, kind enough to join us on the program. Taylor, thanks for joining us. What were your expectations prior to the match against Wales for the United States? Dan, that's an interesting question because I think naturally my expectations before England beat Iran 6-2 was the United States has to beat Wales in order to advance out of the group. Then when that result happened, even more so, it was vital that they had to get three points. And here's the reason why. Ultimately, you do not want to play Iran in the final game for geopolitical reasons, as one of those reasons, of needing to get three points to get out of the group. And the reason why is that's going to be the biggest game in Iran's history. They list now in their history as a federation, 1998, the World Cup game against the United States in France, where they won one nil as the biggest victory of their history. So you did not, you wanted to avoid that. And that's why I think ultimately when you take 24 hours and you reflect on the Wales game, it feels like a loss, even though it wasn't. How do you explain what happened yesterday for Team USA? Uh, You explain it to the sports fan that is not an avid soccer fan. It was a tale of two halves. The first half, Greg Berhalter with his starting lineup and the first half performance A plus, no doubt about it, arguably the best performance since he's been a manager. But here's the difference of what happened in the second half. Wales is a one-trick pony, and that pony is a six-foot-five center forward by the name of Kiefer Moore. They didn't start him. And so you knew if they were going to go down a goal, he's immediately coming off the bench. Dan, they didn't have plan B. They didn't have an idea on how to counter Kiefer Moore coming off the bench And that, I think, is the most disappointing aspect of the game is that tactically they didn't make an adjustment, but more so I think the substitutions and the personnel coming out at halftime with Weston McKinney battling an injury, Serginho Dest and McKinney both on yellows. Dan, Greg Berhalter in the United States, they didn't do anything. They kind of sat on the fence, and that's kind of what you experienced in the second half. What do you expect on Friday against England? Uh, I expect the entire world to see and and expect England to dominate. And this is where the United States, often on the men's side, play at their best when they're a complete underdog. Now, Vegas is not going to have them as huge underdogs, but you and I know what the storylines are going to be. England has always had a chip on their shoulder for making sure that the United States, in this sport particular, feel like the stepchild. The Americans love the English accent. They love what England does. They want to be England in the sport. There's just so many undertones of what it's going to happen. And that is not even on the field where I think England has more talent. But the United States on the men's side always thrive in the underdog. They've got to find a way to get a result. And by saying that, I mean, even if it's losing by just one goal, because goal differential now with the 6-2 victory of the English head over Iran, now becomes the tiebreaker. You just can't lose the game by a lot if you are going to lose the game. I think they should get a draw if you ask me right now. What's your level of confidence, 1 to 10, with the United States? Six. Maybe six and a half. Uh, It's not extremely confident because they're young. This is their first experience. I think it's extremely important, Dan, when you look at the future of where this team's going to go, and this being the quote-unquote golden generation of players. The United States is hosting the World Cup in 2026. This will be the first time the United States men have their best generation of players ever developed, barely in their prime, and they're going to be playing at home. So you want to have a positive experience at this World Cup. You don't want to bomb out of the World Cup. You don't want to do what you did in 1998. But I'm also not saying they desperately need to get to the quarterfinals either. They've got to have a positive result and a positive experience. That could come Black Friday against England. But I'm just not totally confident that this team at the highest of levels can score goals because quite honestly, with how the first half went yesterday, they should have had two or three goals and they didn't create enough quality chances. Yeah, I wondered if this team, it, it's just not their time. and But get mm-hmm. that experience. You, know, you look down through history with teams that win championships. They usually have to go through that Absolutely. losing period. You know, the, the Chicago Bulls with the Pistons, the Pistons with the Celtics in basketball terminology. And I, I wondered if maybe we're too young at this moment. Uh, you know, Christian Pulisic, how much pressure yes. is, is on him? 
in this. And, and, and exactly, Dan, you're hitting the nail on the head because Christian was part of, he was the young buck on the 2018 qualifying team that failed to qualify for the World Cup. So he's already kind of shaped his national team experience with negative experiences. And that's why for this group, with Pulisic being the head of the snake, so to speak, you need to have some positive experience. Christian was okay yesterday. I thought he was fantastic on the goal. We saw Christian of old. But then we've also saw some really bad set piece delivery, some key moments where the final ball wasn't there. That's why my confidence, go back to your initial question of where my confidence level is, in the final third at the critical moments, the United States just hasn't showed enough quality to against a higher quality competition until they do so. My confidence level is going to remain six, six and a half. And mainly that's because Pulisic, need, Pulisic needs to play at the highest of levels to get there. ESPN soccer analyst and host Taylor Twelman joining us. Uh, how do you explain Messi and Argentina losing? <laughs> uh, I, don't, I, don't, I, I have no idea how to explain it. They, they literally were an unbeaten run. That is the second longest in the history of the game. It's the first time they've lost to a FIFA ranked opponent outside top 50 in God knows how many years. I, I don't know how to explain it, Dan. It, the, the funny part is in, in you, we're all part of this now in American sports with video review and instant replay and all that. Argentina did score three goals that were called back to the offside, and one of them was ridiculous. So that's how quickly that game changed. Saudi Arabia deserves a ton of credit for making life difficult. But in 2010, Spain lost their opening game. They won the World Cup. They're the only team to do so. And in 1990, Diego Maradona and Argentina lost to Cameroon and got to the final. I'm not counting Argentina and Messi out, but I'm not sure I can quantify how they lost to Saudi Arabia today. We like bottom line winning championships. Somebody made the comparison, one of my listeners, Messi is like Dan Marino. Oh, wow. Fantastic comparison. I would argue, you tell me, did Dan Marino ever have a supporting cast that justified winning Super Bowls? He got to one Super Bowl. Felt like he had he he had good receivers, but not great receivers, right? Don't you think they they punched above their weight a little bit because of Dan Marino? Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. I think I think Dan Marino was thirty years ahead of his time. Yep, I agree with you. I also think Messi is is an alien. We've never seen anything like it. Now they got to the two thousand fourteen World Cup final mainly off of Messi's shoulders, and he carried him there. Ironically, Dan, if you would have talked to me before the World Cup started, I would have said this is Messi's best chance, and they laid an egg today. So I, it, I, to compare him to Dan Marino is difficult because I don't think Dan Marino is the best player that we've ever seen in the NFL. He was before his time. I agree with you that Messi's the best thing we've ever seen. He's okay, an alien. But He's one a, match a, to one match to win, Taylor. Yes. Give me the give me the best soccer player. You can pick one soccer player. I'm taking Pelé. I'm taking play. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Right. Now, in this generation, because the argument, as you and I both know, social media will take it millions of ways. Messi or Ronaldo, I'm taking Messi 100 out of 100 times. You don't like Ronaldo? Yeah. Make sure you get that on social media just so everyone comes after me. Absolutely. That's the only reason why you did that. Uh, listen, I, I, I like Ronaldo. Sure, it's fine. But Messi's an alien. We'll never see anything like Messi again. I promise you that. We will see another athletic specimen like Cristiano Ronaldo. We will. He may not be at the level that Ronaldo is, but my God, Messi is something I've never seen before. What's it like when they put the card in front of you? When you Nothing when, better. When, when, but they There's call you better. over. They call you over. Like, you, you're getting a yellow card. You're getting... What, what's that like? Yeah, well, Dan, let me ask you. Did you ever get, a, you know, a, a slip in, in, in school where, like, you were called out in front of class and the teacher had to give you a slip and you were like, oh, no, now I'm in trouble? It's no different. It's just... There's a split second where everything puckers up and everything gets real tight. You're like, is it yellow or red? Oh, it's yellow. I'm fine. No problem. Good. I'm good. I'm fine. When it comes red, then you're like, oh, no. What did I just do? Did I do it? And I did. Can you say Honestly, anything? It's kind of fun. Can you argue your case? Yeah, but once the card shot, there's no video review. There's a little re There's actually video review now that can maybe change it if it's egregious. But usually they don't. 
but you could say anything you want. That referee's not all of a sudden going to go, yeah, you're, you know what? Good <laughs> argument. I'm going to put the card back. Now it's out. Once it's out, you're in trouble. Scariest atmosphere you ever played in? Oh, that's a real good one. World Cup qualifier in Central America where I thought people were throwing water at me. I thought they were throwing objects, and it was uh, urine, feces, and batteries. Wow. Okay, yeah. if you have to pick now, listen, Dan. <laughs> in this business now, and being in the media, I it's not you know. I, I would argue I've had bags of feces thrown at me in different ways. It's just it's never really hit me <laughs> on the shoulder. Yeah, it's usually on social media. It's, a, it's a, exactly. It, it's a bag of uh, feces. Uh, yeah, huh? That's a tweet there. But if you were going to uh, pick, you could have batteries, urine, or feces thrown at you while you're playing. Yeah, listen, I, it's totally fine. Like, I, I'm a dad now. I'll take a bag of urine any day. I, I'll figure it out. And, and, you know, maybe I'm exhausted. I could use electrolytes. To answer your question, though, to answer your question, Borussia Dortmund, we played Germany in Dortmund Stadium, and it's the yellow wall behind the goal, and it's over 30,000 fans just behind the goal. Dan, I'm not going to tell you how many times I had to change my underwear before that game started. What do we, you do? You still have people who, uh, you know, four years ago they bring up your "What are we doing?" rant to you? Yeah, uh, yeah. It's I'm on cameo, and uh, one would argue that I made uh, thirty people's day on. Va- By the way, they asked me to do that on Valentine's Day. Just let that simmer, Dan. I had many <laughs> people ask me to do. What are you doing? Wait, is it is it a breakup video? A, a breakup video on Valentine's Day? <laughs> Wait, what are we doing? What are we doing here? I, I just, I, I did it. I played the game, but I kind of want to know the backstories of why on Valentine's Day, I was requested more than any other day. Not Christmas, not New Year's Eve, Valentine's Day. What are we doing? You going to have a meltdown if we don't advance? No, no, okay. I won't have a meltdown. That was, uh, I'm going to have a meltdown because Charles Barkley's actually figured out his swing because the last time we played, Dan, I think he lost, and you can text him this, that I said this. I think he lost three and a half dozens of golf balls <laughs> at Boston Golf Club. You know what You know what helped him, cured him? It's two new hips. I don't care what swing coach told him what to do. He got two new hips, and boy, he's uh, good for him. I feel, I feel for Chuck. He needed to fix that. Yes, he did. Uh, hey, great to talk to you again, Taylor. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, no problem, my man. Be good. That's Taylor Twelman, the uh, ESPN soccer analyst and uh, former member of the national team.